Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Krishna Mushti Vinish Pata Krishna Mushti Vinish Pata Nish Pishthan Guru Bandana Nish Pishthan Guru Bandana Kshina Sattva Svina Katras Kshina Sattva Svina Katras Tam Ahativa Vismita Krishna Mushti Vinish Pata Krishna Mushti Vinish Pata Nishpitan Guru Bandana Nishpitan Guru Bandana Shina Sattva Svina Katras Tam Ahativa Svismitaha Krishna Mushti Vinish Pata Nishpishtan Guru Bandana Kshina Sattva Svina Katras Tam Ahativa Vishmita Krishna Mushti of Lord Krishna's fists Vinishpata by the blows Nishpishta pummeled Anga of whose body Uru huge Bandana the muscles Kshina Diminished, diminished. Sattva, Sattva, whose strength, whose strength. Svina, Svina, perspiring, perspiring. Gatra, Gatra, 
whose lens tongue to him. Aha, he spoke Ativa extremely. Vishmita astonished. His bulging muscles pummeled by the blows of Lord Krishna's fists, his strength faltering and his limbs perspiring. Jambavan, greatly astonished, finally spoke to the Lord. Jane tvam sarvabhutanam prana ojasaho balam Vishnum Purana Purusham Prabhavishnum Adhiswaram. Jambavan said, I know now that you are the life heir and the sensory, mental, and bodily strength of all living beings. You are Lord Vishnu, the original person, the supreme, all powerful controller. Twam hivishwa srijam shwasta srishtanam apiyat chasat kala kalayatam isha para atma tatatmanam. You are the ultimate creator of all creators of the universe, and of everything created, you are the underlying substance. You are the subduer of the subduers, the supreme Lord and the supreme soul of all souls. <clears throat> Purport. As Lord Kapila states in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Mrityus Charatir Mad Bhayat, death himself moves about out of fear of me. Om Akyan Timidandasya Gyanan Janat Shalakaya Chakshuru Militam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Sri Guru Sri Juthapada Kamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavam Scha Sri Rupam Sagrajataham Sahagana Raghunathan Bitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Padijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padahan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpatarubhyascha Kripasindubhya Evacha Patithanam Bhavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Adhaita Gadadhar Shivasati Gaura Bhakta Brinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare 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 Krishna We are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, 
chapter 56 entitled The Shamantaka Jewel. Text 25 through 27. We have been reading how Satrajit, one of the members of Yadu dynasty, worshipped Surya, the sun god, with such attention. He became such a dear friend of Surya that Surya gave him the Shamantakuchu. As was explained, such a precious gift that was, according to Rupa Goswami, presented to him by Srimati Radharani, which she received from Balaram, who received it from Krishna, who recovered it from Shankachuda, who got it from Kuvera. So everything has a cause and effect in this world. But ultimately, everything comes from Krishna and everything goes back to Krishna. But thinking under the illusion that it was his property, he became illusioned. As soon as one thinks I am this body, those things in the relationship to this body are mine, then we come under the spell of Maya. And in that spell, arrogance and greed and lust and anger, envy and illusion, they all come naturally. So the root cause, Janasya Moho Yamam Hamamet, is this misconception that anything is separated from Krishna. The actual truth is I'm not this body. Jivara Swarupoy Krishna Nityadas. I'm the eternal soul that's temporarily occupying this body. And my true nature is I'm the eternal servant of Krishna. And nothing is mine, but by Krishna's grace, I have the opportunity to serve. <laughs> but the allurements of this world, without any strong association, of sadhus or enlightened people, we can easily become bewildered. And one of the most powerful um, allurements of maya, to cast us into illusion and keep us in illusion, is to think that we're enlightened to think I don't need that association. I don't need to perform my sadhana very carefully because I'm stable, I'm advanced. We become stable and remain stable and advanced as long as we humble ourselves to recognize the power of maya. Srila Prabhupada would sometimes say, the problem with you Western young boys and girls is you do not have sufficient fear of Maya. And Mumbai is more westernized than most Western places. <laughs> so don't think that that is not applicable to us.
But when we read Srimad Bhagavatam, we get a clue of how powerful Maya is. Here is Satrajit. He's a Yadu. Not only that, his daughter is Satyabhama, <laughs> who's an expansion of Srimati Radharani. So he's not just an ordinary fellow, as you would call him. He's a very special person. But this Shamantaka was such a spectacular, dazzling um, possession. As we were describing yesterday, it was so effulgent that anyone who had it just looked so beautiful. It's like when you go down the roads in almost any city in India, there's all these hoardings or billboards displaying ads for advertisements for jewelry shops. Yes. And you usually see these elegant jewels on some beautiful lady or handsome man. And the idea is that if you have this jewel, you're going to look like this lady. <laughs> <laughs> or if you have this jewel, you're going to look like this man. Or you see on television two people, a young man and woman, or on the advertisement billboards, you know, they're, 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 they look so nice, they look like they love each other so much. <laughs> and then it tells you that they use this toothpaste. <laughs> uh, you're laughing, but it actually works. <laughs> They have some of the most highest paid PhD psychiatrists and psychologists figuring out these ads, advertisements. So the this, this subconscious realization you get, if I use this toothpaste, I will be happy like that. <laughs> hurry, hurry. but we are transcendental to those, those, <laughs> to, those, to those allurements, at least we're supposed to be. But it's very powerful. <clears throat> so the Shamantaka jewel, whoever had it, was so beautiful and so popular and so famous. And 170 pounds of gold it produced every day if you did some puja. Some of you, you, know, you do puja and you want some material benefits. It's really Krishna's mercy you don't have the shamantaka <laughs> <laughs> How he became bewildered. But it's interesting. The problem wasn't the shamantaka jewel. Because Surya, the sun god, he wasn't bewildered by the Shamantaka jewel. He just gave it away. Shankachuda was, was bewildered by it, and even Satrachit, because they were thinking, it is mine. And that's the root. When we start thinking in terms of janasya moho yamamahamamaiti, I am this body and those things in relation to the body are mine, then lust, anger, and greed, and so much fear. Because as soon as you think something is mine, then you begin to think something is theirs, and then you start thinking people must envy me or I have more than you, and you get so trapped in that sense of identity that you become fearful, and for good reason, because everything is going to be taken away from you. All your knowledge, material knowledge, all your abilities, all your strength, all your fame, all your possessions, by the power of time, everything is taken away. So Satrajit fell under this spell. 
But if we just see that same shamantaka jewel or anything in this world, any opulence, as the property of Krishna and use it according to Krishna's will, then it's not the source of bondage or illusion, it's the source of liberation and enlightenment. This is the principle of bhakti. Because maya is so strong, even if you renounce shamantaka jewels and wealth and strength and all these things, if you're not Krishna conscious, then you'll become proud of being renounced. Look what I gave up. You didn't give up this. But this person gave up even more than me. So envy and arrogance and greed and anger and all these things could come out of renunciation too. <clears throat> Therefore, Rupa Goswami tells us real renunciation, the deepest, fullest renunciation, is simply to understand that everything is the property of Krishna. And to connect it with Krishna through seva, through devotional service. So Krishna wanted to help him give the jewel to Ugrasena so everyone will benefit. But he he had doubts about Krishna. Why is he asking me to give it away? And this is why it's very important to have the associations and to hear from Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, and from these scriptures in that association regularly, to study the purports of Srila Prabhupada's books very carefully. Otherwise, we can see the opportunity to serve as a threat rather than a blessing. Faith is very important. When Srila Prabhupada asked us to take vows, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling, no meat eating, chant at least 16 rounds every day. It takes faith to be willing to do that. because almost everything that the society around us is telling us will make us happy, we're being asked to deny ourselves of. And to many people who are friends or family members of the devotees, they think, what are you doing? This is a curse. But if we have faith, the ultimate blessing because we recognize that this way I could use my body mind words life for Krishna's in harmony with Krishna's will in Krishna's service so Satyajit worshiped the jewel and was getting all the results that is dear brother Prasena use it for a day but Prasena was killed by a lion. But Jambavan was so strong. Jambavan didn't need a weapon. With his own hands, he just did away with the lion because he really wanted the jewel. Now, he didn't have the same kind of attachment to the stool of Satrajit. He wanted to give it to his son to play with. And when Krishna entered the cave of Jambavan, because it was so dark and so deep, he told the residents of Dvorka, you wait out here. And there he saw this little boy just playing with the, ch with the shamantaka jewel. <laughs> just like a toy. The child had no conception of its material value because everything is relative to our particular perception. Krishna came to get it. The nurse screamed, Jambavan came out, and there was a great fight. And here we find 28 days from 
from sunrise to sunrise without a break for even a minute. They didn't take even a minute's rest from their constant fighting. 28 days. Now, Srila Prabhupada explains different perspectives of this fight between Jambavana and Krishna. <laughs> One perspective is from a philosophical point of view, because Krishna tells many lessons from different angles of vision of his leelas. Jambavan had an attachment for his son and an attachment for the jewel because it was giving pleasure to his son. So when he was alarmed that someone was going to take that away from his son, he was angry. As soon as we have an attachment that's disconnected from Krishna, when there's some danger or, or reversal, we become angry. So attachment and anger, he came to fight this person. He didn't recognize him. Because Jambavan knew that he was the strongest man on earth. And a very, very historical devotee. He was born from the yawning of Lord Brahma. He was he was playing the bugle when Brahma was washing the lotus feet of Vamanadev after he reached the highest planet and pierced the universe with the Ganges. He was circumambulating Vamanadev when he was in his huge form. He was one of the most intimate, loving associates of Lord Ramchandra. Best friend and like a shiksha guru for Hanuman. That's quite an exalted position, to be a shiksha guru for Hanumanji. So he was fighting. It wasn't until he became so weak and so beaten down. <laughs> All his pride was diminished then he could recognize that this is my Lord. Why it took him 28 days to figure it out? <laughs> because as long as we have attachment and anger, we can't really understand Krishna as he is. It's only when he surrendered. He realized his humble position being completely dependent. And then his anger became gratitude. His attachment became love. And Krishna revealed himself for who he was when Jambavan surrendered. So this is an important principle. Now Jambavan, it's he was attached to his son, enjoying the Shamantaka jewel. And because of that, he couldn't really understand that this was Krishna. But as soon as he did understand it was Krishna, he gave his daughter to Krishna, who was more dear to him than his son. I've never had children, but I know a lot of people who have children. And a father, to a daughter, there's a very special attachment to that. Because daughters you know, are usually more dependent on their fathers. Sons, as they grow older, they really want to prove their independence. <laughs> 
So a father, you know, wanting to protect, in a protective mood, has a very, very deep place in the heart for a loving daughter. <coughs> so Satyabhama was his, the most loving daughter. And as soon as he recognized this as Krishna, he just wanted to give Satyabhama to Krishna. And not only that, but after he gave Satyabhama to Krishna to be his wife, not Satyabhama, Jambavati, I'm sorry, I got it wrong the whole time. Jambavati, as soon as he gave Jambavati to Krishna, he felt so happy he took the Shamantaka jewel and put it around the neck of Krishna. So the question is, what happened to the son? <laughs> son lost his sister, Jambavati, and, and, and the Shamantaka jewel. And Jambavan was real happy doing that to him because <laughs> For, for Krishna's pleasure, Sarva Dharaman Purusha Jaya Mame Kam Sharanam Purusha Aham Fum Sarva Papibhya Moksha Ishimimas. He abandoned all varieties of dharma and just surrendered to Krishna. And that's the perfection. After this, Srila Prabhupada writes, Krishna honored and respected Jambavan as a king, as his father-in-law, and Krishna treated Jambavan like a superior. As long as Jambavan was fighting Krishna, Krishna was beating him. But Prabhupada says, that after Jambavan surrendered with the same hand that Krishna was like thunderbolts crushing the muscles of Jambavan, <laughs> Krishna started massaging him with the same hand. And his, Krishna's hand was so soft and so soothing and, um, and instantly Jambavan was feeling so nice. So when he was not in the mood of seeing that his son, the jewel, everything was Krishna's property, Krishna's hands were like thunderbolts. But when he just recognized this and offered with love, then that same hand became soothing and soft like the petal of a lotus flower. Samba was the son, one of the sons of Jambavati and Krishna. What was Jambavan's exalted position? Eternally as the father-in-law of Krishna and the grandfather of one of Krishna's most illustrious children. And getting back to Satyabhama, <laughs> sorry I made the confusion. Um, when Krishna give, comes back to Dwarka, everyone was so worried because Krishna was in there fighting for 28 days and the residents of Dwarka, after 12 days, they went back. And they told everyone, we don't know what happened to Krishna. He just disappeared in this cave and never came out. Devaki, Vasudev, Rukmini, they were so troubled by this. Greatly worried, because the nature of their love for Krishna was they were seeing him more as their son or their lover than as the supreme absolute truth, the personality of God. That was just the nature of their relationships. To facilitate the dynamics of devotion, of praying. 
So they were worshipping Chandrabhag, a form of Durga in Dwarka for Krishna. And Sri Prabhupada explains, if we worship a deva like Katyayani for the purpose of pleasing Krishna, with Krishna in the center and service to Krishna as our only desire, then that's Krishna consciousness, it's auspicious. But when we perform that type of worship, like Satrajit, for me, <laughs> without the service of Krishna in the center, then it becomes material. It's unfavorable for devotional service. So Krishna comes back and he has the Shamantaka jewel around his neck. And he has a wonderful, beautiful wife, Jambavati. So they were very happy. And Krishna called for Satrajit and gave him the jewel back. We're going to read this in the next verses. But before we discuss that, there's another explanation Prabhupada gave of this fight. As we said yesterday, only a devotee who's empowered by Krishna in a favorable, loving way could give Krishna the maximum enjoyment in fighting. Hiranyakashipu and these people, there was some, but Jambavan was so much stronger than them. 28 days, and they were both really, really trying to defeat each other. So Krishna wanted to have this, Jambavan was a great warrior. He wanted to fulfill Jambavan's desire, and he wanted to fulfill his desire to receive the love and devotion of Jambavan through his strength. And as soon as Krishna was satisfied, he revealed himself to, because Jambavan would never fight Krishna if he knew he was Krishna. So Krishna, he covered his identity over so that they could have a good fight. And as soon as Krishna was satisfied, he revealed himself to who he was. And Jambavan was most happy. So <clears throat> Satrajit felt so guilty, now he has the jewel, and he spread all these rumors in the past. When Prasena didn't come home, he was whispering around Dwarka and it spread like wildfire among people who were less intelligent that Krishna killed his brother because he wanted the jewel. This is to the degree people see the world according to their own attachments. Srila Prabhupada comes to the West. There's people here in India, you can't even imagine what they were looking like when they were coming into 26 Second Avenue or Frederick Street in San Francisco, Haight-Ashbury. And Prabhupada was saying that they're all Krishna's children. They're all potentially pure devotees. That was his vision. And even when he found the, the, the shortcomings in people, it was like a doctor seeing the potential health in somebody, pointing out the disease that's covering it. But if we're envious, if we're attached, if we're greedy, then the tendency is anything somebody does that seems to be familiar to those qualities, we immediately think it must be like that. So Krishna, what does Krishna care for a shamantaka jewel? <coughs> Jambavan, in his prayers, he is saying that Krishna is the creator of all creators. And he's also the creator of all creation. That, that covers everything. <laughs> 
He's, he's the creator of Surya. He's the creator of the sun planet that, that Surya is, is presiding over. <clears throat> he's the creator of the Shamantaka jewel. Everything that exists, Janmadya Salya Daha, is coming from Krishna. Krishna is not in need of anything. In Goloka Vrindavan, every grain of sand is trillions of times more valuable than the Shamantaka jewel. <clears throat> And there's limitless grains of sand. What to speak of kalpa briksha trees? Limitless kalpa briksha trees and surabi cows. Anything you want, they give you. That's Krishna. And he has limitless goddesses of fortune constantly serving him. But because Satrajit was so materially attached to the conception that that Shamantaka jewel is mine to enjoy, as soon as his brother Prasena didn't come back, he imposed his own conception on the character of Krishna. <clears throat> because I'm so attached to this jewel and I'm willing to do anything to keep this jewel Krishna must have killed my brother to get this jewel Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur he gave us a very practical formula of how to deal with this tendency he said whenever you he said, the only reason I see faults in others is because I am honeycombed with so many faults myself. The tendency to find faults in others is a testimony that on myself I am plagued with faults. <clears throat> if we're genuinely doing it for, with compassion to uplift people, that's... That's devotional service, that's compassion. But if it's not on that platform, then finding faults in others is just the evidence that, my God, I'm so full of faults. I see envy so much because I'm envious. I see greed because I'm so greedy. Now a devotee sees all these things in conditioned souls, but to overcome to overcome those tendencies and to help others, to protect others. But materialistic people, they actually find joy in finding faults with others. It gives some gratification, gives some boost to their egos. So we have to be very careful. Because the nature of the ego, even if we're burning with envy, the ego will tell us, I'm just being compassionate. <laughs> I'm just upholding Dharma. So we have to be really careful and we have to be very sincere. Srila Prabhupada would emphasize his qualities. That we have to take this Krishna conscious seriously. That means we have to understand our vulnerability to duplicity and very carefully guard ourselves against it because it could ruin anything. You see, the, the, the biggest problem with material attachments, especially to our own abilities, to our own intelligence, to our own wealth or fame, is it creates this fear. And we make offenses. 
A humble person doesn't make any apparats. He may accidentally touch you with his foot or something. <laughs> but those are little apparats. But to actually try to tear people down, that's serious. And here is Satrajit. He was trying to tear Krishna down from his position. He was thinking, Krishna must be like me. He's attached to the jewel. Krishna's willing to murder someone to get that jewel. That was his thinking. And he's a yadu. And Krishna, he had many purposes. On one level, he wanted to clear his name. When he gave the jewel back to Satrajit, Satrajit felt so guilty. He was actually really sobered by the situation. Krishna made such a dramatic orchestrated performance out of this. Because here, <clears throat> Krishna goes to get the jewel back, to prove his innocence, and then he doesn't come back. And then the residents of, who came with him come back and say, we don't know where he is. He went in the cave. So now they're thinking maybe he's gone. And they're all doing worship and they're crying and they're praying and they're, and they're feeling so much worry. And in the meanwhile, it's all because of Satrajit. <laughs> so Satrajit really got some bad um, vibrations. And then Krishna comes back and he says, Satrajit, this is what happened. Prasena was bit by a lion. <laughs> and then Jambavan hit the lion. And then I, just to bring this jewel back to you, I fought Jambavan for 28 days. Here's the jewel. Can you imagine how humiliated? And Krishna said that in front of everybody. <laughs> so Satrajit was really feeling guilty. He was sober. What did I do? I have to somehow or other atone for this. He was ashamed. <clears throat> Publicly, personally. So his daughter, Satyabhama, who was so beautiful and so full of good character and all divine qualities, so many princes wanted to marry her. And anyone he wanted to get favors from, he would say, yes, I will consider you marry my daughter. <laughs> and they would do anything for him. So <laughs> and that was a problem. When he gave to Krishna, there were some very important people who were kind of upset with him. I thought you were going to give her to me. <laughs> <clears throat> so Satrajit gives his beloved daughter Satyabhama and then gives the jewel back to Krishna. And Krishna says, I'm happy to receive Satyabhama because she has given her heart to me, she's given her life to me, and she loves me and I love her. But you can have the jewel. After all, you have such a nice temple for the jewel. <laughs> and you could go on worshiping in the temple. And actually, because your temple is in your palace, which is in Dwarka, everyone in Dwarka is going to get benefit from your worshiping. So he took the jewel back. To end class, I would just like to give an insight about how Krishna took this pastime, which was such a challenge, it had such negativity, and in the end, Krishna transformed it into the most positive thing possible. <clears throat> Here, Prasenna is 
killed. <laughs> Krishna is accused of being a murderer. All this is happening, but what's the end? The result of it all? Two of Krishna's most prominent queens, Jambavati and Satyabhama, are the result of this great um, trauma of the Shamantaka jewel. And this is how Krishna gives us shelter. If we just turn to Krishna, everything becomes auspicious. And even in the most inauspicious apparent things, Krishna makes it completely auspicious if we just turn to him. And there are so many examples. In Kurukshetra, when Krishna went there to meet the residents of Vrindavan, there is a discussion between Draupadi and the queens of Dwarka. Because Draupadi is from Hastinapur. And she was asking the various principal queens how they got to marry Krishna. <clears throat> it's interesting. Draupadi was a wife who had five husbands. Krishna was a husband who had 16,108 wives. So there's some, some dynamics for discussion in these, <laughs> in these relationships. So Draupadi is asking the queens, you know, how did you marry Krishna? And Rukmini, it was all these principal queens, it was all out of serious trauma that they got Krishna. Rukmini said that Jarasandha, <laughs> Krishna's worst enemy, who attacked Krishna 18 times with millions of soldiers each time. Jarasandha was Kamsa's father-in-law, who wanted revenge on Krishna, and Krishna made his two daughters widows the wives of Kamsa. So he was vowed, he had vowed to destroy Krishna. And he tried with all of his powers. And Rukmini said that Jarasandha and my brother Rukmi, they had arranged for me to marry Shishupal, the person who is most envious and hateful of Krishna, of anyone. And I gave my heart to Krishna. And in previous chapters we read and discussed what was Rukmini's situation. She was so desperate. It's a fate limitlessly worse than death. For her to have to live the race, the rest of her life with Shishupal? Can you imagine? She loved Krishna. She gave her heart and soul to Krishna. If you're living with Shishupal, you're only going to hear the most nasty lies against Krishna 24 hours a day. That was her fate. So she was really taking shelter. She was sending, she sent a letter to Krishna. And she said, in the end, just like a lion takes his prey from a few goats and sheep, <laughs> Krishna rescued me. Right at the moment when she was about to be, to be formally married to Shishupal, Krishna took her away. At the time of the biggest crisis of her life, Krishna was there for her. And Jambavati, she told her story. 
she said, Krishna came into the cave of my father and they fought for 28 days over the Shamantaka jewel. <laughs> and in the end, my father recognized him as his beloved Lord Ram. As soon as he humbled himself before Krishna and gave up his anger, Krishna revealed himself and he gave me and the Shamantaka jewel back to Krishna. And, and Satyabhama told Draupadi, and as far as me, my uncle, Prasena, he was killed because of attachment to the Shamantaka jewel. And my father, he accused Krishna of murdering my uncle. And to clear his name, Krishna went into the forest and he fought with Jambavan. And, he, and then Satrajit gave me to Krishna. So in all of these cases, the three most prominent queens, which were Krishna's ultimate treasures in Dwarka, they were all, they, it, it, uh, it was all a result of, of great, great challenges. And we see in the lives of our acharyas, how many challenges are there and what the result is. In the story of Narottam Das Thakur, he was, he was a kayasta, which to certain Brahmins in Bengal at the time were considered like shudras. And the most learned Brahmins, like Ganga Narayan Chakravarti, were taking initiation from Narottam Das Thakur. And this was considered to be the ultimate insult to, this, to the materialistic Brahmin community because it was really ruining their, their power and control over society because they didn't have the qualities of Brahmins. They had the position by their birth as Brahmins and certainly they were extremely learned and many of them very pious materially. But, but because of their learnedness and because of their piety and because of their position by birth, they had a lot of power. And if a sudra is initiating the best among them, that's going to disrupt everything. So they went on a massive campaign blaspheming Narottam Das Thakur. And when Narottam Das Thakur, he was blasted and blasted and blasted so much by these people. And then he, he, he appeared to have died or passed away. And his devotees were crying and they put him in the funeral pyre over the wood and they were about to light it on fire. And those same Brahmins, they came and started blaspheming Narottam Das Thakur while his body was on the funeral pyre saying, just see what an injustice he has done to the world. And right in front of their eyes, his dead body started glowing. And then something really incredible happened. Do I have time to tell? <laughs> On his glowing body, this incredibly effulgent, sacred thread appeared on his body. It was totally supernatural and transcendental. And then he smiled and sat up. <laughs> and all those smart Brahmins who were there, when they saw this, they all surrendered to Narottam Dastak. 
So he took the worst possible situation and made it into the best possible situation. And that's how Krishna works. And that's how devotees, because challenges, reversals, difficulties, disappointments, inconceivable impediments, things that we just don't plan or want, they happen to everyone in one way or another in this world. And anyone could complain, or anyone could give up, or anyone could say, Krishna, what are you doing? Maybe you're not even there. Anyone could do that. But a devotee takes shelter with faith because we read all these stories. <laughs> the best things can come from the most difficult reversals. That's Krishna's way of doing things when he descends into this world and that's his eternal leela with his devotees in this world. If we read the lives of any great saints, it's always in challenges that Krishna reveals his most intimate blessings on those devotees. You know, Ambarish was a great devotee. But if he just lived happily doing his puja in his palace, who cares about Ambarish? Millions of years later, but when Durvas Muni was angry with him and tried to kill him and created this gigantic monster. <laughs> and Ambarish, if you think you have a problem, how would you like that fiery monster about to devour you? Hmm? And how would you like Durvas Muni, who's an expansion of Lord Shiva, who has 60,000 disciples right behind him. And they're all like mystic yogis with cities. And D Durvas Muni's eyes are like red coals, totally angry and wanting to destroy you. And not listening to your excuses at all. And takes a hair out of his head and <laughs> creates this fiery, uh, monster that has the power to devour the universe in a moment and that fire and, and, um, and Durvas goes kill him and that monster has come right over you and it's not like he was you know in India and he was taking a jet plane to <laughs> to London to get you he was right inches away from Umbari she was created right in front of him what would you do? Dravas Muni is Shiva. <laughs> That's where Ambarish was revealed to the world for his greatness. He just folded his palms. Krishna, I'm yours. And because he surrendered his heart to Krishna, Immediately, within a second, Sudarshan came and rescued him from the fiery person and then went after Durvasa. And even greater than anything, Ambarish immediately was forgiving Durvasa Muni and praying for his welfare. And even in Vrindavan, in, in the Bhoma Vrindavan of this world, according to Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and our Acharyas, every day some Asura came. And they were not Asuras like we know. It was like Putana and Aga and Trinavarta. These Aristasura, Keshi, these were really fearful personalities. 
And in every one of those situations, the Brijabhasis turned to Krishna. And Krishna revealed such beautiful pastimes. So many of his names, Uddhava, when he was remembering Krishna in the most intimate way, he was thinking he made Putana his mother in the spiritual world. So don't be misled by your mind to lose your faith because there's, because things are not going your way or because there's reversals in your life or because there's challenges in whatever form they come. It's through these challenges in this world that Krishna connected with Rukmini and, and Jambavati and Satyavama. And it's through these challenges that we can connect with Krishna. How? Krishna's in his name. Hey Krishna, hey Govinda. When you think of Draupadi, what story do you think of? The first story that you, comes to your mind when you think of Draupadi is usually one of two things. Either when Dushasana was trying to take her clothes off, or when Durvas Muni came <laughs> and asked for food for him and his 60,000 disciples. And they were all sadhus. And it's incredible how much those sadhus could eat. <laughs> when I was living with sadhus and Mithila and Himalayas and all these places, I remember there was this one Utsav in Mithila, in Janakpur. And there were so many sadhus there, they were coming. One of the, um, it was the disappearance day of the guru of an ashram there. And I was, you know, I had lived with sadhus and I was thinking, you know, sadhus are yogis and they don't eat that much. And they all came with different kind of bowls. <laughs> some had like pumpkins and some had wooden bowls and some had leaves and some had skulls. And really quite variegated. And I couldn't believe how much these sadhus were eating. They were eating mountains of rice, like what we offer to Govardhan. <laughs> I mean, they're just, you know, the person serving rice and the sadhus, you know, they're not supposed to look like they want a lot of things. But, you know, they, so they don't ask for it but they have ways of indicating. You know, the person puts a ladle of rice and the sadhu goes. <laughs> and another label, the sadhu goes. Another label, no, it's like this. Then when it's like enough for a, for a hundred sadhus to eat practically, then he'll go. They were, they were all doing that. So Durvas Muni brought 60,000 of these sadhus. And Yudhisthir, you know, Duryodhana sent Durvasa just to humiliate, just so that Durvas Muni would curse Yudhisthir. He said, I'm hungry, and all my disciples are hungry, and we've come to your house. And Duryodhana sent him just after Draupadi had already eaten from this Akshaya Patra, this special pot that could feed as many people as possible. But after she eats, it becomes just an ordinary little pot. There was nothing left. And Draupadi was really, really desperate. Yudhisthira Maharaj said, we have to 
Fix Prasad for all these 60,000 sadhus. <laughs> now they're just bathing in Yamuna. They're coming in a few minutes. And she prayed to Krishna completely helplessly because not only herself, but her, her, her husband's, everything was on the line. And Krishna appeared. So when we think of Draupadi, we usually think of these incidences. That is Krishna's way. And how did Draupadi, how did she connect with Krishna? She took shelter. Reversals are the most beautiful opportunities to take shelter. If they happen the way we like it or the way we plan it, we're not going to really take shelter. But because they're exactly the way we don't want it to happen, that's when we feel really humbled by the situation and we take shelter. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, through Srila Prabhupada taught us how all of us, at every moment, we can take shelter of Krishna's holy names. Please forgive me for saying so, but you don't sound like you're taking shelter. <laughs> His Holiness Jayadoita Maharaj, would you like to speak something? Is there any questions? <laughs> In this unpredictable world, some things and some people are predictable. <laughs> Maharaj, uh, we can predict, talking about Satraji. We can predict the nature of your question too. <laughs> Maharaj, taking the example of Satrajit, how we got misguided because of Sammanta Takjual. In the same basis, it's very practical problems that we Grahasthas face. Sometimes the Grahastha gets a windfall in his business or a profession. Gets a what? some big jackpot type of a thing or a big amount of Lakshmi, he gets it. Mm. Sometimes it happens. And most of the time, every Grahastha has an experience in their life that sometimes he has got a big chunk of Lakshmi or a big, big fortune he has got it in his life. Mm. And when that fortune comes in his life, there are many times it so happens that we lose our imbalance. We become imbalanced. At that time, we don't feel it that this Lakshmi has been, I have received, or this fortune I have received. That is for Krishna's service. Mm. But it is, it is exclusively for Krishna's service, it is not for myself. Mm. We, we forget about that. And in the name of Yukta Vairagya, or in the name of many other excuses, we think that I am using it in Krishna's service, but we use it for our sense gratification. And we don't check, we feel it that I am doing everything in Krishna's service, but we slowly and sweetly understand it, that something is going wrong in my Krishna consciousness. And if we are a little bit sincere and if we cal calculate it out, we see our balance sheet to be very clear. When we see it, maximum of our Lakshmi has been used for our sense gratification rather than using for Krishna's service. And then outside way we see it, we tell them I am using in Krishna's service. And we can give lots of convincing reply also. But in our heart we know it that we are cheating Krishna. Now, and sometimes what happens is Maharaj that our body, bodily inconvenience is there because of our old age and everything starts. So sometimes we feel that I need some rest, I need some comforts so that my Krishna consciousness becomes smooth enough. And that basis we give an excuse. 
So how to go on checking ourselves? That is it because of bodily needs? Is it because of why, why, so that my Krishna consciousness goes smooth? Or is it because of sense gratification? I am using that thing for myself, not for Krishna service. Because it has a direct effect in our consciousness. So what, is, what should be the barometer for a devotee where he can check it out? Because I'll give you one simple example, Maharaj. That devotees, they invest in some Lakshmi. I'll give you one simple example. Those people who have invested 1 lakh rupees before 19 years back in stock market, within 19 years back that 1 lakh rupees has become 74 lakh rupees. So the, the devotees, when the child has been born, they say, that, let me just put this small amount of Lakshmi for my child's name. And when the child is grown up at around 19 years, 18, 19 years, the amount has become 74 lakh rupees. It's a windfall. It's like the jackpot that they have got it. So it, it becomes completely, the mind becomes completely imbalanced. He feels that now let me spend the way I want to spend at it. And at that time all those philosophies goes on the back door and everything becomes sense gratification becomes in front of it. And so what is the barometer that a devotee has to check it, that it doesn't get carried away and the borderline is very clear enough that this Lakshmi is meant only for Krishna's service. And if at all the bodily needs are there, we'll use it. But it should not be at the cost of Krishna consciousness. It is a matter of sincerity. <coughs> to be honest and sincere before Krishna, before our Guru, before the Vaishnavas. And in order to connect to that sincerity that is inherent within us, we need nice satsang, nice association of people who remind us. We need sincere sadhana, where we're really reminding ourselves through sravanam kirtanam. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami says this sravanam kirtanam, hearing and chanting about Krishna and the association of devotees is the nourishment that makes us strong spiritually. Just like food, food grains, they give us physical strength to perform our duties and overcome many obstacles on the physical level. So the obstacles that come in our spiritual lives, we are given the strength to overcome them through hearing and chanting in the association of devotees. And that's very important. If in this world you're really, really weak, you understand the necessity to eat the proper foods and get the proper rest. So similarly, we should know for sure that these allurements and entrapments of mayas are going to be for us. So if we're sincere, we'll humble ourselves and know that I need to hear and I need to chant. It's not just a ritual. It's not just something I'm supposed to do because I said I would do it. It's not something I'm, that I, I'm supposed to do because everyone in the society around me of devotees are expecting me to do it. Beyond that, it is a dire necessity for my spiritual survival. I will be illusioned if I'm not hearing and chanting sincerely in the association of devotees. And in the case you're speaking about, especially we can hear this story of Satrajit and the Shamantakaju. It's the special, precise medicine for what you're talking about, this story. And along with reading the story of the Shamantaka Jewel, we, sh we could also listen to the tape of Ananda Brindavan Prabhu's question. <laughs> that will have a very powerful effect, I think. Does that answer your question? Hare Krishna. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. 
uh, we have two situations that uh, that are in front of us here in the story where Krishna is trying to uh, protect his name and he goes uh, goes on to uh, to really uh, find the jewel and on the other side we have the story of uh, Shiva's Thakur where he was uh, you know the deep Gopal Chap Kopal was trying to blaspheme him and put things and he actually went and said, said this, this is what I do, please have a look, this is what I do. So he was not really trying to protect his name. So coming uh, with these two scenarios as far as our practical uh, situation is concerned as devotees, uh, should we really try to protect our name and sometimes protecting the name appears to be like we are trying to really, you know, become famous or we were trying to not be humble in one sense. So what should we do as a practical thing because as leaders or as devotees we really need to sometimes protect the names. Some people misunderstand us and we need to really clarify uh, uh, that what they are thinking is wrong. So in these two situations how does one do? Krishna is doing something and the devotee is doing something else apparently. We should do what's most favorable for devotional service. Devotees, faith in Krishna is the basis of their, their, their shelter, their spiritual survival. So, Krishna did so many things according to time, place, and circumstance. When Jarasandha came to attack Krishna, he ran away. It means Ranchor. Ranchor means one who runs away from battle. And for a Kshatriya, that's the worst dishonor to run away from battle. But we love Krishna. We name our children Ranchor. <laughs> Because Krishna is so wonderful, he's so loving, he ran away from Baal. In that way, it demonstrated his supreme renunciation. In this case, um, on one level, to clear his name, because it wasn't when Krishna does, it's for our benefit. It's ultimately for our benefit. And for a devotee, especially a preacher, as His Holiness Jayadvaita Maharaj was telling us in his last class here, um, if people don't have faith in us, there's very little we can do to serve them. Because our, our, our goal is not to be famous, our goal is not to become great, our goal is to serve. But to the degree people have faith in us, to that degree we could serve them if we're trying, if we're preachers. Yes, otherwise they don't listen to us or they don't take anything we say seriously. So if we're defending ourselves in that way as a service to others, Krishna sees what's in our heart then that's an important offering of devotional service. But if we're defending ourselves for my own personal aggrandizement, or because of the, my own personal pa pain at losing that aggrandizement, then that's unfavorable. And according to time, place, and circumstance, different people do different things. Srivas Thakur was completely innocent. And there were these nasty rumors being spread around him by nasty people, and he just couldn't care less. Why? He's spending the whole night, all night, with Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, Gadadhar Pandit, Haridas Thakur, Advaita Charya, Pundarik Vijayanidhi. What does he care if some Brahmins out there are saying some things? He was happy. 
param drishtvani vartate. He was experiencing such a higher taste doing kirtan all night, every night with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all these great devotees. In his heart, he ultimately knew that by just by acting the way he did, he was actually doing the greatest service. He was an instrument of Krishna to show how to serve in this way of total detachment. So in time, place, and circumstance, in each case, they were simply doing what was the best way that they could, could serve and what was the best way that they can actually demonstrate the qualities of a Vaishnav in, or the qualities of uh, in compassion for others. Does that answer your question? So in our situations, we should really understand that this is what Krishna sees. That we're putting service to Krishna, service to the Vaishnava, service to our Guru as the first consideration in our life. And we could consult people who have realization and wisdom as to how we can best deal with certain situations. So now Shamananda Prabhu has a special presentation to Krishna. Hare Krishna, so Balde Prabhu has ordered me to do a very pleasant service. This is the results for the Prabhupada Marathon year 2014 with profound joy, jubilation and also immense gratitude. We would like to offer these results by the Iskon Shishi Radha Gopinath Mandir Chopati. We distributed 209 Back to Godhead magazines, 59,759 small books, 843 medium books, 1,793 big books, and 1,33,519 Maha big books. Starting this year, we have also compiled a small book on the realization, stories, adventures, anecdotes of various devotees who took part in the book distribution effort. So I would like to request Srinathji Prabhu, Narasimhat Lila Prabhu, can you get it? Srinathji Prabhu to offer this book to Srila Prabhupada and uh, Nitai Prasad Prabhu will offer this book to His Holiness Radhana Swami Maharaj. For those devotees who would like to read these stories and if you would like your stories also to be included, please visit the ISKCON Radha Gopinath Mandir Facebook page. So this will be an annual feature. We will try to uh, see that most of the stories and all the adventures which we have in this book description effort get documented. I remember very clearly, it was 1994 and Radhanath Maharaj gave the Chopati managers this mandate that 20 years down the line our devotees should feel fortunate and happy that they took part in the Prabhupada Marathon. So that will be our sort of a guideline year after year and we would like to thank all of you who took part and we look forward for another eventful and maybe a better score 
in the year 2015. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai His Holiness Jayadvaita Swami Maharaj Ki Jai Anantikoti Vaishna Brinde Ki Jai 